It's so great to be here tonight. Are you happy to be, are you happy to be here? Yeah. yeah? How many of you, like, somebody's watching your kids and you don't have to worry about it? Good. So good, right? Fantastic. How many of you had a really crazy week and you're just glad that you can sit in the presence of God tonight? Yeah? Amen. Me too. Well, I'm so, we've been friends of this house for a very long time, and I'm, it's just such an honor for me to be here. We live in the um, D.C. area and just recently transitioned our church, and my husband and I are loving life right now. We're just um, traveling and doing and uh, sleeping a little bit more, <laughs> maybe. Uh, I wanted to show you a picture. I'm not going to lean too far. My biggest prayer was, Lord, please don't let me fall into the orchestra pit. <laughs> There's my family. Okay, aren't they, gr I know, it's one, two, three, aww, yeah. Um, so standing next to me is my handsome husband. Tonight is our 44th anniversary. I know. And he's such a great guy. I was like, so, he's like, go for it. We can go, well, this, is, this is what I'm at 44 years. Every time we go to dinner, I tell him it's our anniversary. Because, right, we made it this far. We should celebrate every time we go out, right? And then, plus you get a free dessert. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> And then um, on the, in the middle is my daughter, Bethany, and she's our eldest, and her husband, Alex. And they are, they're, all of my kids are my favorite, but they are currently my favorite favorite because they have the two grandkids, and they're the yummiest kids ever. Um, and then next to them, right directly next to them is um, our daughter, Gabby, and her husband, Colby, and they were recently married. And Colby actually played drums here in this church, so I just want to say thank you very much. Love, church because he's such an amazing human. And then we have on the very end, uh, this end, and then next to me. So this end is Jessica. She's single. She's 38. She's an entrepreneur. She's very wise, very smart. She's amazing. So if you have a son that does not live in your basement, <laughs> Um, go ahead and follow her on Instagram. That's Jessica Pisani. <laughs> Message her. And then next to me is that very handsome young man, Evan. And he is called to ministry. He is kind. He's, he, has so, he acts like Jesus, more so probably than I do. And he's just amazing. He also is single. And if you're interested <laughs> and you're under the age of, if you're 30 or under, we don't want anybody older than 30. Because that's kind of like cougarish, right? <laughs> Anyways, Evan Pisani on Instagram. Follow him and message him and tell him that you were in this meeting and your, his mother told you to message him. Anyways, don't really do that because um, I did this before and he's like, Mom, are you pawning me out again? <laughs> I was like, I want you to get married. <laughs> so. I'm just so grateful. I have a message I believe is a word from the Lord for you tonight. And so I would encourage you, what we used to say in our church was, if you take notes take notes. And if you don't take notes, take notes on your phone or you can write it on your girl, the back of your girlfriend's shirt, whatever you want to do. Because I believe it's a word from God. And I don't know if you're like me. I have a hard time remembering what happened last week. And next week I may need what this word is. And so I want to encourage you to just maybe take a few notes as it speaks to you. But a few years ago, we have the four children that I just showed you. And a few years ago when they were all younger and Evan was still in a, a car seat, Gabby was about three years old, and uh, Beth and, and Jess were about 10 and 12 years old, we, uh, you know, in the busyness of life, we decided to go and have some of the Lord's food, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and... Um, while I got the kids all settled into the booth and Gabby in the high chair and put Evan in his car seat on the seat, I said to the older two, hey, could you just keep an eye on the little ones? I'm going to go place the order for your food. So I left them in the booth and I walked over to where the um, counter was to start ordering their food and I could hear this crying. It was like a wailing coming close. You know, you as a mama, you know when it's your child's cry, just wailing and coming closer and felt this little body clinging to my leg. And I realized it was Gabby. She had wiggled out of the high chair. So I said to the woman, just a minute. And I, I don't know why I didn't just hold her and make the order. But anyways, for this specific purpose, I was putting her back in the high chair, strapped her back in, said to her sisters, can you just keep an eye on her for a minute? I, I want to do this order. So I go back over to the counter and... <laughs> 
I hear the wail again. And this happened like two or three times. And, and I thought, this is crazy. Like, I, she's hungry. I know she wants the food, but I can't even get the order in because she's so impatient. So they picked her up, put her back in the high chair, and said to her sisters, guys, it's not, it's not rocket science. Just make sure she doesn't get out of the high chair. And God spoke to me in that moment, and he said, you're just like this. He said, so often you are in such a hurry to receive what you cannot wait for that you are wiggling out of the restraints that I put on this season. And I, I realized in that moment that sometimes, I don't know about you, but for me, oftentimes when I would be praying for God to do an answer, my frustration was because I thought the miracle was when the answer showed up. And I failed to realize that the miracle is just as much when God puts the restraints on us in this season so that we can actually handle the answer when it comes. The problem with when we have to wait for the answer is, is that oftentimes we define ourselves in the wait negatively because other people don't have to wait as long as we have to wait. For whatever, you know, like maybe you've been waiting for a husband or you've been waiting for your kids to straighten up or you've been waiting for a health issue to go. Whatever it is you've been praying for. And somebody else prayed and they got it in three nanoseconds. Like they hardly know Jesus and they got the answer. And you've been in this for 25,000 years and you still can't see God moving the way you want to. Then we start thinking that there's something wrong with us. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You start defining yourself negatively. And when the problem with defining yourself negatively is this, is that pretty soon we begin to believe what the enemy tells us, and that is that we can out-sin God's grace, and then we'll never experience all that he has for us. Like, God's grace is good for you, but there must be something wrong with me, and until I can get myself together, then finally, then God will answer me, when a lot of the time we don't realize it's God's restraint because he's preparing you for what he's getting ready to do. Turn to the girl next to you and say, she must be talking to you. <laughs> I have never seen so many cowboy hats in church before. I am loving this. It makes me wish I had a hat on, right? I know. I feel like you should all just lift your hat and say, yeehaw. yeehaw. Look at that. <laughs> Here's the thing is that I have found in serving God for over 40 years is that I think probably the missing ingredient oftentimes in the miracle is that we need patient expectation. Patient expectation. In fact, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 10.36, patient endurance or expectation is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all, everybody say all, all. that he has promised. He didn't say, then you'll receive 30%, then you'll receive 60%. He said, you're going to receive all that I promised. Like, sometimes in the middle of the wait, I'm like, I'm really good with 30%. <laughs> like, could you just see something happening? But it's all. And I hate that I have to wait for it, but God is so faithful. And we're going to get real tonight. I, I, I feel like it's really important to, we're not going to have on a religious face. We're not going to be... We're not going to be somebody that we're not. I just want to encourage you. Let's get vulnerable tonight. Is that okay? Because we can't, God can't bless who you're pretending to be. So if you walk away from, with one thing tonight, here's the one thing. That the wait is worth it. And the wait is the point. Some of you are like, oh, I, didn't, I came here tonight for this. I thought it was going to be a party. <laughs> So we're going to read between the Old Testament and the New Testament was about 400 years of silence where they didn't really hear God speaking, a very long wait. And so I'm going to begin reading in John chapter 2 when Jesus appears on the scene, and um, I believe God's going to speak to you in this. So if you have a Bible, you can turn or you can look at the screen. So now on the third day, there was a wedding feast in the Galilean village of Cana. And the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus and his disciples were all invited to the banquet. But with so many guests and attendants, they ran out of wine, which in that culture was like a huge social faux pas. So when Mary, his mother, realized it, she came to him and she said, they have no wine. Can't you do something about it? And Jesus responds, he's like, my dear one, don't you understand that if I do this, it won't change anything for you, but everything is going to change for me. It's not my hour right yet for the unveiling of my power. It hasn't quite come yet. 
But Mary, being the insistent Jewish mother that she was, goes to the servers and she tells them, whatever Jesus tells you to do, make sure that you do it. Everybody say the servers. Now there were six stone water pots. Everybody say six stone water pots. See, there's not one detail in the scriptures that's there that isn't important. And I can't tell you how many times I read this scripture before and never saw the fact that there were six stone water pots. And it doesn't just tell us there were six of them. It tells us that each one held about 20 gallons. So that's 120 gallons of water that they're going to fill these six stone water pots with. Jesus went to the servers and said, fill the pots with water right up to the very brim. And then he said, now fill your pitchers and take them to the master of ceremonies. And when they had poured out their pitcher to the master of ceremonies to sample, the water became wine. And when he tasted the water that had become wine, the master of ceremonies was impressed. Although he didn't know where the wine had come from, but the servers knew. Everybody say, the servers knew. See, I believe, this isn't my message, but I believe the people who serve are the first ones to see the miracle. But that's just, that's free. That's not part of this message. <laughs> He called the bridegroom over and he said to him, every host serves his best wine first until everyone else has had a cup or two and they don't know what they're drinking. And then he serves the wine of poor quality. But you, my friend, you've reserved the most exquisite wine until now. The miracle in Cana was the first of many extraordinary miracles that Jesus performed in Galilee. This was a sign, everybody say a sign, revealing his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, you know, a sign, how many of you are in a situation right now where you've just been waiting for a sign from God that he's, he actually hears you and he's moving? And maybe you're not there right now, but you've been there before. You know what I'm talking about? Just, just give me a sign, just anything, just to know that you're moving and, I, and there's something happening in, in heaven on my behalf. Well, I think it's fascinating because a sign points to, gives you direction, right? Tells you like a road sign tells you, how, like I got lost several times coming here because I wasn't paying attention to the signs. Sometimes we don't see the signs because we don't under, we're either preoccupied or we don't understand what the sign is saying. Anybody else have a, a Waze app or a GPS app that is slightly two seconds slower than the turn? Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm like, really? And they assume that I understand what 1.6 miles is. I have no idea. <laughs> Sometimes we miss the sign because we're not paying attention to the sign. And so I thought this was fascinating. Why would Jesus use this as the first sign to mark his ministry? Like if I was going to start a movement, my first sign would be raising the dead, right? Or healing the blind eyes or the deaf ears, which he did later. But, but why would this, like it's a party trick. Cool party trick, Jesus. Are you free on Friday night? I'm going to go to Costco and get six cases of water. Let's see what can happen. Like, that, that just seems crazy. But if this was his first sign, maybe there's more to it than what we're seeing at face value. And I want to dig into this tonight because I think it's a powerful, powerful sign that many of us, myself included, have missed for years. They asked for wine, but they first got water. So nothing is insignificant in this. Now... All of us in our homes have running water, correct? There may be somebody in here that does not, you, you, but I doubt that there's, I know I'm out in the country, but I doubt anybody here has to go to a well to get your water. But most of you just turn a spigot on in your house. But back then, they didn't have a spigot in their house. They didn't have a hose to just get the water. They had to go to the well to get the water. And I don't know how far the well was from this house. Most of these communities had a, a center well in the middle of town. So I don't know how far this wedding feast was from the well. But somebody, those servants, had to go to the well and fill some sort of container up and then take it back to the six stone water pots and pour the water in. Now, it wasn't one gallon. It wasn't two gallons. It was 120 gallons of water that they had to fill six stone water. I want you to imagine this with me. Like at what point did it become wine? We're not really sure when it became wine. It would have been nice when they were pumping it. The spigot was like, oh, look, it's wine. Now we get it. But I'm pretty sure they had to take probably many, 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 many trips waiting for the ordinary to become extraordinary. Waiting for the water to become a miracle. 
See, the problem is, is that sometimes when God tells us to do something in obedience, we get a little frustrated because we only see the water. And we think it should become wine immediately, but we don't realize that it is every step that you take actually is a positioning you for a miracle that God wants to transform. It's a powerful thought. In my own life, I can't tell you how many times I wanted to, I just got tired. Anybody, nobody else? Am I in the right house? I'm going to move this back just a little bit. I'm sorry. Isn't the boot amazing? Right there. Everybody pray in the name of Jesus. She doesn't knock it over. Okay. Well, if it knocks over, guess what? It's okay. Anybody holding your breath? <laughs> okay. I can't tell you. Did it fall? Aww. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> we need a miracle, Lord. <laughs> You're waiting for that miracle to take place. You've been praying. <laughs> Maybe your body hasn't felt well. I don't know what it is you're facing, but it would be nice if God would put like an, like an expiration date on the end of your wait, right? None of us would have a problem waiting if there was an expiration date. And all of us have destination addiction. We can't wait to get there. And when we get there, then we'll start living when we get there. But right now, we almost miss this moment because we can't wait for that to happen. When this moment is as important as that moment. Because God will speak deeply to you in this moment. Some of you are like, please move on to the next point. I'm just saying we get tired of carrying the water in the middle because it hasn't happened right away. And so what happens, maybe you're like me. I had a skirt on. This was a little iffy. Are we modest? Yes. <laughs> in the middle, sometimes we just get tired of waiting. And then I want to take it into my own hands because the burden of the outcome what I'm hoping for sometimes becomes so heavy that sometimes I'm just waiting for the outcome that it's very difficult. The burden of obedience becomes heavier than the burden of the outcome. Wow. And just saying yes in the middle. How many of you have been, like, you've just been praying? Like, maybe you've been praying, like for me, like to lose weight. And you've just been praying for God to change your metabolism. And it's been 60 years. Like, where's that pill? Well, I guess there is one now. Anyways, I don't, never mind. Side. Or maybe you've been waiting for your health to change. Or maybe, maybe you've been, like, waiting for a man to come. Is there any single women in here? About four of you. A few, yeah, you're raising your Like, I'm not sure why I'm going to raise my hand. Raise your hand. Like, you had a whole list of expectations in the middle of that way. You know what I'm talking about? Like, we, like I, he, needs to become an, he needs to be handsome, he needs to have money, he needs to come riding in on a white horse. And so you, you have all these checkoff points. Like, um, Lord, I'd like him to read. But then, <laughs> oh, he doesn't read? I read. That's fine. I'd like him to have a job. Oh, he doesn't have a job? I have a job. Check it off. He lives in his mother's basement? Well, he must be good with women. Check it off. <laughs> We're waiting for your Boaz. Yes. And all that's showing up is Poaz. Lazy ass. <laughs> Lives in his mother's ba basement ass. <laughs> and so we change our expectations, right? Patient expectation. You receive all. But sometimes in the middle, we change our expectations because we have, and then we sit down and we kind of become a little bit familiar and we're not leaning in. I, I heard this Brandon Lake song on the way in and he said, there's more power in the hem of Jesus than there is in all of hell. Is your expectation in the middle of the way as strong? Are you leaning in like you were at the very beginning or has it kind of waned in the middle? Maybe, maybe you did get that husband and now you're like waiting for him to just see that there's laundry on the floor or put the toilet seat down or you wait for your marriage to be healed or maybe you're, you couldn't wait for kids and you finally got kids and now you're just waiting for sleep. And again, it may come when they're 18, I don't know. I'm just saying that in the wait, we can often give up. And what happens in the wait, if we're not careful, is what God means to become a garden that's flourishing begins to look like a graveyard. A graveyard of hope. Graveyards are full of hope deferred. 
Graveyards are full of places where we've had so much expectation and hope, and then it, all of a sudden it looks like a graveyard. The only difference between a graveyard and a garden is what you put in the ground. I want to stir your faith tonight. I don't know where you are on your journey. You may be a teenager. You may be an, a grandma in the room. You may be in the middle. Maybe you've got your young family. I don't know where you are in the middle, but everybody, I want to encourage you. God will allow you to be put in situations that you can't always handle on your own because you need him. And the only way to see the miracle is to be leaning on Jesus. I don't want to become so familiar with my life and so comfortable with my life that I'm not pulling from God everything he has for me. Don't get so satisfied in where you are. So that becomes a graveyard. And it reminds me of a woman named Mary. And Mary was in a graveyard. And can you imagine Mary in the graveyard? She followed Jesus. You know, there were so many Marys in the Bible um, that there was Mary, the mother of Jesus. This was, and there was Mary Magdalene. This was, this was the Mary from whom seven demons came out. Can you imagine, like, you go to Starbucks and you see a friend like, oh, this is Mary. She had seven demons. This is, like, how you're recognized. This is the Mary that's in the garden. And I can't imagine the, the hope deferred in that moment. They don't understand fully what, what has just happened. Like, what did Jesus, he, we followed him for three years. We saw miracles. We saw so many things happening. And now he's dead? Like, I want you to put yourself in that place. Like, can you imagine what she's thinking? I'm thinking that she's remembering all those moments and, and in her heart, sadness and grief because of what feels like it's lost right now. The Bible tells us, and it's so powerful. In fact, do you mind if I, I'm going to be stripping down as we go because it's a little hot up here. Turn to your neighbor and just fan her. Thank you. Ooh, does that feel good? Lift your, yeah, go ahead, yeah. And she's in, in this moment, and this is so powerful. I, I've missed this as well. All of a sudden, you know, Peter and James were the first ones to go. Well, they go see the, the tomb, and they go in there, and all they can see is the grave clothes. They see dirty laundry, and they leave. <laughs> Which doesn't, I didn't mean that to be funny. <laughs> okay, whatever. But then Mary looks into the same tomb, and she sees angels. And they say to her, who are you looking for? Which I love that. I feel like sometimes in the middle of an obstacle, in the middle of a battle, God will say to me, who are you looking for? What are you looking for? Because sometimes it's a, it's a redirection of, oh, wait a minute, right, I'm looking for you. Because yeah. sometimes we can be looking for the answer and we miss the sign. Yeah. And so she looks in and she sees these angels and then she sees somebody standing next to her and she assumes it's the gardener. And he says to her, who are you looking for? And she's like, oh, my Lord, you know, like, where have you been? Like, have you not heard what's happening in Jerusalem? And then he says his, her name. He says, Mary. It's one of the tenderest conversations in the Bible. It always brings tears to my eyes because of the intimacy of this moment. And when he says her name, Mary, I think it's laced with familiarity and laced with resurrection. And in that moment, she realizes it's Jesus. And she says, Rabboni, teacher. Now, do you know how powerful that is? Because in that culture, women could not be disciples of rabbis. Jesus was the only rabbi who allowed men and women to follow him. It's groundbreaking. So that's why I don't want you to take for granted that you actually have a Bible that you can read. Because there are many cultures where women aren't allowed to, to, be, to read the Bible or even be taught the word of God. Women were excluded from the temple and the holiest places would teach. This was groundbreaking. Jesus included everybody in his teaching. But what was so significant of this moment is that Mary's actually in the second garden. The first garden was the Garden of Eden, where Eve was. Now stay with me for a minute. Here's the thing about Eve. When Eve was tempted by the enemy... The enemy said to her, you are not enough the way you are right now. You need to eat from this one tree. God must be holding back from you. Because if you eat from this one tree, you will be like God. Well, where's the lie in that? She already was made in the image of Christ. God. She was already made in God's image. Well, what, what was the temptation? It was a scarcity mentality that told her you are not enough in who you are. And I'm telling you right now that every one of you in this room faces that same temptation 
daily. The enemy will say to you, you're not smart enough, you're not thin enough, you're not strong enough, you're not courageous enough, nobody wants to hear what you have to say, and you get tempted to lean back. I don't know about you, I get tempted to take control of the situation because I'm not enough. And it switches my view of how I see God if you're not careful in the middle of that place. Well, why is it significant that Mary's in the second garden and Eve was in the first garden? Eve yielded to the temptation. And the, the promise to Eve was that your seed will crush the head of the enemy. Now, Mary is in the second garden with the seed of Eve, Jesus, who had just crushed the head of the enemy. And what does Jesus say to Eve? Go tell. Let's read it together. He said, uh, John 20, 17. Go to my brothers and tell them. Everybody say, tell them. Oh, that was a good one. Somebody say it as loud as that young woman. It's the cowboy hats. Bread. <laughs> I love it. What? Tell them what? That I'm ascending to my father, to your father, to my God, and to your God. Okay, so not only were women not allowed to be taught, women's testimony was not allowed in a court of law. Women had no voice. There was no value to their voice at all in that culture. So Jesus could have appeared to John and to Peter, who were there just a few minutes. It wasn't like he was confused and like, oh, the guys came too soon. Shoot, now I got to appear to a woman. No, what was God doing in this moment? He was redeeming the voice of the woman because for thousands of years, she'd been blamed for the fall. And in this moment, Jesus was setting freedom over your mouth. And what was he saying to you and to every woman in this room? Go tell what? Resurrection. Not resurrect. I mean, resurrection is a noun. That's Easter. Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead. It was an event. Je not just resurrection as a noun, resurrection as a verb. It is an active, present power of God working in your life. And in your mouth, you have the ability to speak resurrection over every dead situation, over every bucket of water that doesn't seem to be turning into the miracle yet. You have the power in your mouth. Because the Bible tells us in Revelation, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. What was that? The resurrection in your mouth. You have the power to overcome any lie of the enemy that tells you you are not enough. And the power of Mary in that moment was Mary didn't yield to any temptation. She turned towards the gardener, towards the teacher, towards the rabbi. It's just that simple, turning towards him rather than away from him. Now here, this isn't even my message. Y'all got me going. It must be the cowboy hats. So the word of God is so much, there's so much life to the word of God. The Bible says that it's inspired. That means breathed into. So every time you read the word, even if it's one verse, you're breathing in the very essence, the breath of God. Inspired means breath of God. You are breathing in the essence of God. So when God said, light be, those two words in the Hebrew became an energy force that circled the earth 187,286 miles per second. So every time you feel the sun on your hand, that is the evidence of God's voice. So when God said, go tell, those words are echoing in this room right now. It, there's no expiration on God's words. His voice is breathing into you right now in this very room. There's life to it. And when you speak his words... It brings resurrection. Turn to somebody and say, she has to be, she's Sicilian. She's just a lot. Yes. So you decide, you decide, you're the one who decides if your journey of carrying the water bucket is littered with tombstones or milestones. Don't allow your failure in the past to define you in the present. It's a milestone. You learn from it. Let the wounds from the past become wisdom for the future. Don't let the hurt from the past make you somebody you're not. Become who God sees you to be. Okay, so what's, what's the pivot point? Everybody say pivot. My favorite friend's show was when they were trying to get the couch up, and they kept yelling, pivot. Everybody say pivot. So, but the thing is, is that 
I love that because they didn't know what the word pivot meant, right? Was it Chandler? And the couch got stuck in the stairway. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but anyways, pivot. There comes a point where you have to know what pivot means. Actually, can we have a keyboard come up? Keyboard guy? What's his name? Connor. Connor. Here he's coming. Is that you? Look at you running. Come on, Connor. Connor. So this, this is the pivot. Oh, Connor, look at you. You're like Oh, look at this. This is amazing. Could you just play some water into wine music? Yeah, thank you. No pressure. Look at you have cowboy boots on too. Let's give Connor a hand. Anything. Any, just like instrumental. Perfect. Do you feel your water turning into wine tonight? Anybody want to take Connor home with you? <laughs> are you married? Oh, you are married. Okay, good. Um, the pivot point. I almost lost what I was saying. Here's the pivot point. You're too young for my daughter, so. And you're married, so there we go. <laughs> Here's the pivot point. It's this very sacred, holy word, and it's henene. Everybody say henene. Not to be confused with the whip and the nene. <laughs> but it's a posture, and Moses said it when he was standing in front of the burning bush, and it simply means in English, here I am. It's not a here I am, God. You didn't answer me, did you? I'm over here. You missed me. Pick me. Can I be the next one to get the answer? No, it's a here am I surrender. Jacob said it. Abraham said it. Isaiah said it when he was in the middle of political turmoil and chaos was happening. He said, here am I. Hanene, send me. And I found that in my life, when the water hasn't turned into wine, that my pivot is, okay, I don't understand. Here I am. Henene. It's like a henene walk. It's a daily surrender. Surrendering 10 years ago isn't enough. It's a daily surrender. Sometimes I have to surrender five times a day. <laughs> here I am, God. Henene, here I am. I don't understand it. I don't want to be in control of when this turns into wine. I just want you to do the work in me that you need to do. It's a powerful, powerful Surrender that we can say to God daily. The hanene in your mouth, the ability to speak resurrection first comes with hanene, here I am. Then you can speak life because you're surrendered to what he wants to do. But we just talked about how patient expectation is what brings all of the promise to God to pass. And I was in the car a few Years ago, I got into an Uber, and I knew it was going to be a crazy ride with this guy because he had gospel music turned on. Fourth, My hair was whipping back. It was so loud. And he turned around, and he looked at me. He said, do you know Jesus? And I thought, well, we're going to meet him if you don't keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> yeah. I said, yes. And he said, well, he said, do you know what the meaning is behind this story of the water being turned into wine? And I had just been reading it that morning, and I'm a pastor. And I was like, yes, I know I'm a pastor. I know Jesus. And I began to tell him my interpretation. And he turned around again. He said, that's not the interpretation. I said, well, I'm a pastor. You're an Uber driver. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to sound like entitled, but. And then he proceeded to tell me the miracle. He said, here's the miracle. He said, when Jesus turned the water into wine, He said it wasn't cheap wine. It wasn't like wine you get at 7-Eleven. It wasn't like mediocre wine. It was exquisite wine. The best wine, that takes years to ferment. He said in a moment, God turned the ordinary into the very best wine. Well, you might feel like you're waiting forever for God to work the miracle, but in a moment, it's the wait And then in a moment, the wait, and then in a moment. And here's the miracle. Is your miracle 
is not the water turning into wine. You are the water turning into wine. God is taking you as an ordinary human. And every time you take a step and you say, Hanene, God begins to transform you on the inside. And it's no longer you, but pretty soon as you're carrying this and you begin to pour it out, it, people aren't just seeing you anymore. They see the brokenness of your past. They see the frustration of the present, but they see Jesus in you. 60 years ago, we lived on a second floor apartment. I was just between the ages of three and four. And the landlord that lived below us was a grandfatherly type man and, and he had no children and so he would invite me down to have coffee with him like maybe once a week. So my mom would dress me up. It was back in the 50s. She'd dress me up, and I'd have, like, a frilly dress on and lacy socks and bows in my hair, and I'd walk down those steep stairs to his apartment or to his house, and he sexually abused me. And for years, that marked me. For years, I was told, don't tell anybody because nobody will believe you, and this is happening because you're too beautiful. So what it did was it, a little t truth was beauty is painful and you don't have a voice. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. See, if you're not careful, your experience will become a belief. And the belief becomes truth to you, which is directly opposite of God's truth and God's purpose and God's calling over your life. And so for many years in my life, I didn't speak up. For many years in my life, I didn't feel like anybody wanted to hear what I had to say. If you said, Donna, you're beautiful, I'd say, oh, no, I'm not, because it was painful to be beautiful. And I didn't pay attention to this little T truth, because it was a lie that became a truth, until years later in my life. And I realized it was the enemy. See, oftentimes behind the lie is a purpose that God's calling you to. So when the enemy told me I didn't have a voice, God's like, no, you have a voice and I'm going to use it. Yeah. Whatever the lie the enemy is telling you that is defining you with fear and failure and your past and everything else, whatever is behind that fear, whatever is behind that failure, God has a purpose attached to it because he'll redeem whatever the enemy's trying to do. Yeah. So a few years ago, my, I was walking through my mom's house. She's in her 80s and she's like, hey, she's like, you know, I'm in my 80s. I just want you to pick out anything you want in the house. And I said, you know, I want this. I said, I, I, I've always been drawn into it. You've had it on your dresser for years. And I said, by the way, I don't know the story behind it. She said, oh, that's an antique. She said, Mr. who lived in the basement in the downstairs house, Mr. Smith, he gave it to me for you. And I remember, I was like, but I still want it. And I brought it home. And my husband said, why do you want this? Why do you want this? He said, isn't that a reminder of the pain? And I said, no, I want it. This is my bucket of water. This is my bucket of water. And daily, as I said, here am I, God. I need you to heal the pain. I'm going to pour out. Here am I, God. It's not wine yet. It still hurts. It's still a little painful. I'm still listening to the lies. But here I am, God. And I wanted his truth to speak louder in my life than what the enemy had tried to stop me from doing. And I'm here to tell you tonight that whatever it is, this to me is my bucket of water that became wine. And I'm not just cheap wine. I'm not mediocre wine. I am the most exquisite wine because the cost to my transformation was 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on a cross and he turned a graveyard into a garden and resurrection doesn't just transform me, it's in my mouth now. So I want to encourage you to stand to your feet tonight. I want to pray over you. I refuse to be in any room where I have been entrusted with women or men to not speak the truth in a way that breaks and shatters the lies of the enemy. Some of you have been held back. You don't, the worth, even your worth has been battled over. Some of you, you know that God's called you to do more than what you're doing right now. Some of you, God's been encouraging you to speak life over the situations you're facing. And the battle's been so intense. 
But I just want to encourage you tonight. We're going to pray tonight. And if you, you're willing to do it, we're going to say hanene. And we're going to just surrender to God again. But how many of you in here would say tonight, you know what? That little T truth has become truth to me. Go ahead and lift your hand up. Yeah, most of you in this room. How many of you would say that perhaps in the process of walking, you've gotten a little tired of not seeing the answer? Anybody? Okay, how many of you, I'm going to pray, and then how many of you are ready to start speaking resurrection? And resurrection just means I speak life over that situation. I speak life over my situation. I speak life over my body. I speak life over the impossible, and I'm going to keep speaking life until I see the miracle. Because, honestly, what God has on this house, Love Church, is much bigger than you could ever imagine. And God's not just going to use Pastor Brittany and Josh, but he's going to use you wherever you are. So if you're with me tonight, just lift your hands and say, if you'd say, Hanene. So, God, I lift up every woman in this room tonight, and I just thank you for the transformation. I thank you for moving in their lives. I thank you for illuminating to us the areas that we have not paid attention to. We've just gone along with it. Whatever the lie was that we've been listening to, whatever it is that's made us want to give up in the middle, whatever it is that we've been facing, Lord, tonight, as a collective body, we lift our hands, and we say, Hanene. Everybody say it together. A little bit louder. Here I am. One, two, three. Here I am. One, two, three. Here I am. Come on. How many of you would say, Here I am, God? I'm surrendering to you. I speak life over my situations in the name of Jesus. Turn my water into wine. I commit to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, I am a mighty woman of God. I am courageous. Fear doesn't stop me. I listen to your voice. I hear your voice in this room echoing over me. And I declare resurrection in Jesus' name. Amen.